a lot of the the people and the artists that I speak to on this podcast come from what I would maybe describe as a, a similar kind of philosophical outlook on life as yourself, someone who's kind of pondering and questioning things. Is that outlook innate? And do we make art as a result of that? Or is it something that comes from making art? Which one do you kind of feel results in the other? Um, well, it's hard to say whether the, you know, the, whether that's cart before the horse or not. I think that if you're making art, it just, you know, one of the most basic requirements I think is that you are appreciative of anything that might disrupt the normal flow of things, because that's when new things come out. That's when new awarenesses are made. Not to, not to sound too corny because it's kind of a corny movie, but <laughs> uh, Dead Poets Society has a scene that features this very thing that I always used to love to reference whenever anyone would make fun of me for doing this very thing. But he has his students, what's his name? Um, oh, I forgot the, uh, Robin Williams character. Robin Williams's character. Yes. Um, Ooh, it's going to come to me later. Uh, has his <laughs> students, uh, jump on tables, you know, for the express purpose of sort of seeing things differently. So anyway, that's just a crude corny example of, of the, what's sort of happening. I think when you, when you the, what the kinds of different perspectives that one yearns for when when one makes art and this quarantine of course is is offering that in in many many ways but yes i think it probably stands to reason that there is a a predisposition to that kind of uh outlook that may in fact make make someone be receptive to becoming an artist in the first place you know, uh, it's hard to, I don't know, it's this sort of nurture versus nature debate that is very tricky. Yeah, that becomes a, lo- a point after a certain amount of time where the line kind of just gets blurred and it all becomes one big reciprocal thing. I agree. I think you can identify when maybe somebody doesn't have enough of that thirst for looking at things differently. There's like people that are really good at being having successful artistic careers. This is a huge theme in my life because my career has just been so kind of weird and 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 uh, at times inchoate and at times glorious and at times miserable. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the way I'm making it sound right now, that doesn't sound all that special. I'm sure anyone who's had a successful artistic career can, can, can use those adjectives to describe their own experience. But I, I do feel like career versus production or career versus creativity is a really important theme for me. Yeah, Because of that, I've taken notice of when maybe there's an artist out there, I, you know, we're not going to name names, that, you know, does really successful commercial work or something or has really made a good business model out of their creativity. But you can tell that they aren't searching for those new perspectives, or at least they're not making use of them in their creative life. Yeah, you can. I think quite often you can tell from a conversation. You can tell a lot about people from the way they think if you see them in an interview situation. And I think very quickly you can kind of latch on to whether they are someone who is of that kind of question in mind, or just someone who almost has this innate ability to express themselves in a way that resonates with a wide variety of people without actually having mm. much conscious kind of grasp of it. I don't know if that's maybe slightly a pretentious outlook on it. Pretentious outlook on that person? Yeah. Well, I think Just it's true. I said that. I, I don't, that doesn't sound false to me. I found that sounds like sometimes people really traffic in generalities because they want to offend the least amount of people and they want to please the most amount of people. You know, I think that that's that's certainly a a prerogative of 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 good business. Let's say, I was just reading about or listening to a podcast. You know, Jacobin. Ja- oh, ja- yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they they have like Jacobin Radio podcast that just kind of um, bundles together all all sorts of different uh, democratic socialist uh, fare, and uh, one of them is you know sort of doing doing looking into cinema for some of the social more socialist minded variants and they they uh took a deep dive into one of uh godot's early 1970s films tutavien tutavien which i haven't seen and i'm going to as a result of listening to this podcast and 
just the way they were, it has Jane Fonda in it. It's incredibly Brechtian kind of postmodern, uh, weird, somewhat successful, somewhat not so successful attempt to, you know, make, make some socialist points, uh, through the art of cinema that, um, not Godot. What am I saying? That's waiting for Godot. Godard. <laughs> Godard. <laughs> um, it was just fascinating. And, and, you know, they, they said that in this case, Godard was just, you know, he had just accomplished fame and c- creative success with, with, uh, movies like Breathless. You know, he was the vanguard of the new wave and, but then this was almost considered by many people to be career suicide because he was just doing something and it failed. It f- totally flopped, you know, but you know, I, apparently according to the speakers, if you uh, read his journals or, or read some history on Godard himself, he knew what he was doing and he knew that this would be potentially a, uh, you know, a, a risky venture, but he took the risk nonetheless. And I just think that that's, kind of so emblematic of what makes somebody like Godard just like an incredible artist to begin with. Was it a failure because he was almost trying to encompass too much? You know, from what, yeah, from, yeah, that could be it. You know, they're, they're yeah, I'm, I'm sure like he may have bitten off more than he could chew. I, he might have um, just maybe not thought things through. Or, you know, there, there's a whole wide variety of reasons why a movie would not be successful in making their stated goals. But sometimes you can respect the goal, right? Because if you look at any piece of art, any work that you do, an album that you record or a book that you write or anything like that, each one is an experiment and each one is something that posits a question through which the work is an attempt to answer. And you may or may not be successful in answering the question. And by that metric, you could say the work failed, but it didn't fail in the respect of the imagination of the question that it posited, right? So sometimes you uh, listen to a certain album or, or read a certain book or watch a certain movie and it can fail, but you can respect, like a lot of, for instance, a lot of, um, Lars von Trier stuff is like that for me, you know, just really strange, strange stuff that just, I just, you wonder what he was thinking, but you have to respect the process throughout. And then you have someone like Scorsese who realizes at a certain juncture in his career that, you know, he's got some kind of, he's like invented a vernacular that people respond to. And then he just sort of regurgitates it. And there's a difference there. There's, 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 there's a diff. There's, there's like a not so noble failure in that regard. He does take. Risk. I'm, I don't know if you saw Silence that he made that came out maybe five or so years ago. What's it called? Silence, the Scorsese film hmm. with Adam Driver and Andrew Garfield and Liam Neeson. It's about like Jesuit priests huh. in Japan. In I'm not going to try and guess. It's the starting century. to ring a bell. Yeah, but that was a really interesting kind of slow moving, often quite painful look at the kind of both the enlightening side and the dangerous side of mm. religion and what it can do to people. And it was probably more in a Godard thing where it didn't quite hold together as a full thing, but what he was exploring was interesting enough to make you respect mm. it, if mm. that makes sense. Yes. Well that that that's that to me sounds like what you would call a noble failure. Um, and I'll admit that perhaps I've too zealously tuned Scorsese out because I've also learned recently that he's just doing some really great work and a lot of his films of, as of late don't exactly, um, fit the, uh, the cliches that he's been trafficking, trafficking in for a while. I think that, you know, he did really well f- with the aviator and then there was just, a string of bad ones that all seem to be trying to do the same thing. And perhaps I've been too quick to judge in that respect. I also think that late Scorsese as a kind of uh, aesthetic has been co-opted so much. It has become so integral in the way that you tell a certain type of story. It's just expected beginning with Goodfellas, you know? Yeah. He's almost like a, 
a one for me, one for you kind of guy, but he does it in blocks. So maybe he'll do three for them and then uh, three for him. Yeah, that's actually not not such a bad point. Yeah. I mean, he's an industry, you know, that's the yeah. thing. When you he himself is is a business. So, you know, it, it's like you can really contrast him with somebody like Lynch who, you know, I still, you know, to me, Lynch has has been pretty much my whole adult life and continues to this day to be, you know, a, 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 a almost like an infinite source of inspiration for anything that I do. And he is somebody that I think you can definitely detect in his work an utter and total rejection of any kind of business-oriented approach to his movie making. Yeah, there's very much a pretty potent unpredictability about the kind of surrealism that he seems to deal mm-hmm. with. Yeah. What you were saying a few moments ago about this idea of everything, you know, it has a question at the heart of it that they're trying to get to the answer of. It's kind of like what you were expressing in, I think it was the essay you wrote about, or the blog post rather, you wrote about personal essays? About what? About personal essays? About personal essays? About oh, me- yeah. About memoirs, yeah. Yeah, yeah, It yeah, was yeah. kind of in the center of that as well. What was the question then for you at the heart of Homo sapiens interrupt us? What were you kind of trying to get to at the center of that? Mm-hmm. That's a good one. That's a good question, or that's a good example to bring up to try to illustrate the question. For me, the experiment there was, can I reframe my own portions of my autobiography within the story, you know, juxtapose it to the story of um, the first, I guess you could say the first uh, clear anatomical indication in, in the fossil record of human bipedalism or bipedalism. I believe that's how it's pronounced. Meaning, where is the first evidence that we have that an ape walked on two feet? Um, There's some controversy about that because a certain scientist who discovered perhaps the most famous discovery since the most famous (laughs) discovery, which is Lucy, this one's called Artie. And uh, it was sometimes in sometime in the late '90s. He's very proud of his discovery with regard to what he saw in the uh, the sort of tarsal bones of this uh, of this fossil find. He claims that this unequivocally proves that around the time of this creature, which according to the fossil record dates it somewhat around five million years ago. That was the first known instantiation of bipedalism on the part of a of an ape, uh, which is, you know, in paleoanthropological circles, like a huge big deal because it kind of puts a very critical moment in the procession towards Homo sapiens at a very at a much earlier date than what's once previously uh, understood. Um, and so there's all sorts of controversies around that and. You know, that story was sort of the story that I juxtaposed with a certain kind of predilection that I had towards heavy metal and towards playing music or just trying to, you know, be a a musician, a successful rock musician. And like what what forces within me made me want to express myself that way. And. Homo sapiens interruptus came about during a time where, you know, I was still, I was, I actually wrote that while I was still in school. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, it was sort of like, you could say it's like a senior thesis uh, is kind of where it it started. And then, you know, it it inspired me enough that I kept rewriting it. And then I took it to the Fringe Festival. The thing is, is like when you're in school, there's just, I I mean, (laughs) some of the things that you see or that that you do when you're in school is, is just it's bizarre. It's grotesque. (laughs) You're just trying things out. It's just, there's so much insanity in it. And, and I think Homo sapiens interrupt us definitely if were I to resurrect the piece today, let's say I would, you know, it would have to be, it would, it would need to be really revised. Um, because I think back then I was just really jubilant about this sort of new craft that I was, had just learned. Right. So I was, it was really more about just exploring the possibilities, pardon me, of, um, 
of being able to tell a story in this particular way, which I took inspiration from Spalding Gray from and uh, Mike Daisy, who are two theatricians who aren't really known for their acting per se, though they are they are actors, but they, 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 what they're known for is for having popularized this sort of sit down type of monologue where the only thing you see for the entire play is a man sitting behind a desk talking to the audience. And um, how could that possibly be, you know, absorbing? But, you know, when you go and you see one of these pieces, you, you see why it is. It's just, and, and what it does is it communicates the power, just the sheer naked power of storytelling in its essential form without anything, without lighting, without completely denuded of all of the additions, the bells and whistles, you could say. And, and it just makes you see just how powerful this medium is that even just in its most austere for- version, it can still move you so long as the, you know, the narrator is trustworthy and, and, and good. And in the case of Mike Daisy and Spalding Gray, I mean, these were, these were amazing, amazing artists. Well, Mike Daisy's still with us. So I'm, I'm not, I, I don't even for one split second claim to have uh, the, the level of skill in craftsmanship with those two, but they certainly serve to inspire me to just do my version. And so that's what that was. And it was an, it was a, I was sort of using that ability to just be this omniscient narrator sitting at a desk to be able to weave those two stories together and to see if I could draw those connections. And that was the experiment. And I think it, you know, there were some really, really successful parts of it. I feel like I've learned so much about what makes for a good theatrical experience. I've also learned a lot more about my own autobiography that were I to resurrect a piece, I think what I would do is rather than resurrect it or or revise it, I would just write a new piece altogether, which in fact, I believe I'm going to do, although I haven't yet completely uh, where where or how this is actually going to, to pan out. But I, I do imagine that in order to promote the book that I'm writing right now, one of the personal essays that I'm writing will be extracted for the purpose of being turned into a one-person show somehow. And it will likely be that sort of the mise-en-scene of a man sitting behind a desk narrating for the uh, for the entirety of the evening. And so I would just need to like find the right essay to do that for uh, and I haven't yet. So that's certainly a work in process. But if, if I were to run that experiment again, it would probably take that form. It's interesting that you're thinking about extracting one of the essays from the book, because in, in my mind, the way I'd always thought of that kind of framing device and the simplicity of it counterbalanced the complexity of the narrative that Homo sapiens interrupt this sounds like. Where is that story that you're going to draw from the book coming from in relation to that? Does it need to be something that occupies a similar complexity or do you think you could do it if it's a sign of kind of simpler narrative? That's a good question. I I think one of the reasons why I may not be so kind of gung-ho to resurrect Homo sapiens interruptus is, I mean, now that I'm talking about it, I feel like it might be I might be uh, overly harsh. I, I tend to be a fairly harsh critic of my previous work. Uh, I've been noticing that that's a uh, a characteristic of mine, and I think this might be an example. But I think one of the reasons why I don't want to is I do feel like I perhaps bought... It might have been that kind of a situation with Godard where I bit off more than I could chew. It's really difficult. It may sound like you doable, but it is insanely difficult to try to tell a story in a manageable amount of time for a performance like that, which should never exceed more than an hour and a half. I mean, I think Mike Daisy's biggest piece, for, the one for which he un- was unfortunately sca- uh, shamed and there was a lot of scandal around it because he was caught uh, not being as truthful as he was expected to be because he was discussing about factory conditions at um, Foxcom in uh you know, which is a an iPhone factory in China, and apparently he made up a lot of the a lot of the details uh, for the purposes of his uh, dramatic storytelling, and so there was a lot of controversy around that. But that piece, I believe, it was called the 
the life and ecstasy of Steve Jobs or something like that. I saw it. It was brilliant. And I think he was on stage for about a little over two hours, which is, which is a really long time to sit in a theater and watch somebody talk behind a desk. But honestly, I didn't think about the time once. But that's because he's an incredible storyteller. I mean, he is just, it's just astounding when you see somebody captivate your attention that way, which he does. Anyway, to tell that kind of a story within a more reasonable <laughs> amount of time, you're like, let's, let's see if we can just shoot for an hour and 15 minutes, you know, let's not tax the audience too much. And certainly considering, you know, where I'm coming from and how early it is for me within, with, with that craft, I wouldn't want to exceed an hour and 15 minutes. You know, it's incredibly difficult to throw in all these different narratives and all these themes. And I think that was kind of one of the, the problems I encountered. Or, or perhaps why the piece hasn't sat as well as it should, or 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 just hasn't. Um, not that it sat, sat sat badly. I mean, I still I'm very proud of of that piece. I'm just in terms of resurrection, I'm not exactly certain if 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 that would be the right avenue for me. So yes, perhaps in this case, you know, if I were to pull an essay out, I would probably be looking for simplicity. I would probably be looking for some kind of straightforwardness that might, you know, because I'd be selling a book at the same time, right? And I will have just finished writing a book as well. So, you know, I have to be humble too. And also, I think here's another interesting thing. It's good. I'm glad that we're talking about this because this actually kind of vivifies these all these uh, issues that need to be contended with. But um, another thing I noticed is when I'm writing for the stage, when I'm writing a monologue, there's like a different part of me that gets accessed. And I think that that would be normal for anybody who, let's say, decides to, to write a, an essay and then also write a monologue. It's two different art forms, obviously. So there's just, I think the idea of bringing in like the narrative of, uh, of paleoanthropology was felt very natural for a monologue. I don't know that I would want to write a personal essay that tries to link those two stories together in the way that I, it made perhaps more sense to do so, if only for the sheer entertainment value of it as a monologue. And the th I think the thing with Homo sapiens interruptus is well, it's not linear strictly, is it? You kind of no. jump around a little bit yes. in terms of, yeah. Whereas yes. a, a, a essay itself kind of has to be, I guess you can jump around a little bit, but it tends to be more kind of chronological in terms of its storytelling? Well, yes. To an extent. I mean, it depends on what uh, what you're actually discussing. I mean, some essays, so like the Mary McCarthy essays that I read were are very chronological, and they almost lapse into memoir. Uh, they're just straightforward discussions. Uh, they just are so specific that you can kind of rank them as personal essays. Because, you know, it's just a select amount of pages dedicated to this just one aspect of her upbringing, let's say. But when she is in the essay, she's dealing with it chronologically. Because she's also talking about a, a certain phase in her life or a certain sequence of events. And, you know, that works for her. And it also works for plenty of other people. That I've read some in incandescent essays that really just, just sort of deal with a moment. You know, they, it could be like 15 pages just kind of trying to deconstruct a moment, you know, walk in the park or, or bumping into a friend on this, on the, on the corner. I, I'm, I am struggling with this a lot. L the lapse into narrative. It, it, it's so easy. Uh, certainly when I first started writing, I was doing that a lot. And in some cases it's, it's appropriate, but I'm striving for an aesthetic that, or I'm striving to talk about things where chronological treatment would not be so appropriate. I guess if the essays themselves are kind of scattershot from all over your life as well, when you slip into narrative, it's harder to get it to maybe coalesce in a certain way yes. and kind of collect. Yeah. You're yeah. kind of, you're asking the audience to piece together a story where that's not really the intent. I mean, that's another reason why I'm, I decided to write a collection of personal essays as opposed to, let's say, a straight up memoir uh, is exactly for, for that reason. It's because that's I don't want to tell a story. I don't want to turn my life into a biopic. I mean, if there is something that I loathe 
as a genre, it's the biopic. I think that the biopic <laughs> is probably the most toxic form of biographical nar- narrative that I can think of. Um, now, certainly, I may be faulting the genre for its particular instances and not for the actual essence of the genre itself. They happen to make a lot of money because they tend to be about people that are very famous and very beloved. And so, of course, wherever there, I mean, it's my belief that wherever there is a lot of money, there is a lot of corruption. And so that that genre is, is heavily corrupted with formulaic treatments. I was very happy to note that the Elton John biopic was very different in that respect. I didn't, I don't watch biopics, but um, from what I read and what I heard from other people, the way they treated his life was done very, very well because it sort of didn't try to be realistic. It, it tried to, the movie tried to be like Elton John's uh, ethos and aesthetic. And conversely, another biopic of the same time, uh, roughly the same time, which was the Queen one, strikes me uh. as utterly and completely hopelessly mired by the, the uh, vagaries of, of this sort of movie making. And so, yeah, that is something, you know, then, then you have the Bob Dylan one, which I think is an incredible example of what you could be doing with the biopic, right? Instead of trying to tell, instead of trying to tell a linear story, you can actually break up, break up the movie into several different vignettes and have, you know, Kate Blanchett play Bob Dylan in one of them, right? I mean, this, this is truly, this is truly the direction to go in. And we need more of those examples. It's a perfect device for him as well as a person. Like this idea of all the different sides to him and the kind of enigma that he exists as. To cast it as, is it six people I think in the end? Seven? Seven different people maybe? Is, yeah, mm-hmm. a perfect kind of nar- narrative device to frame that in. Absolutely. That isn't to say though that I, I don't want to let, you know, the Johnny Cash movie off the hook, let's say, right? Because I think it did do a, an incredible disservice to the idea of Johnny Cash by turning, by, you know, essentially making a Disney movie out of his life. And that's kind of what all these biopics do. They're just, they're just trash. They, because they, they're just capitalist commodities regurgitated through the prism of nostalgia. I don't know. I just find them disgusting. Um, But I find them disgusting for the same reason that I find capitalism disgusting. So there's probably no, no surprise, (laughs) no surprise there. Um, And, and so hence I, and in my own work, you know, I'm trying to make my, mem- you know, let's call it a memoir, but I put that under heavy quotations. What it really is, is a collection of personal essays. Um, my book, I want to make it biopic proof. That's sort of one of the goals is to sort of insulate it from the, the grabby paws of capitalism's endless efforts to commodify everything it touches with its pasticular hand. Um, sorry for all, sorry for the, uh, the flaming <laughs> rhetoric, but anyway, um, that's, that's sort of a goal. And so to kind of the first, I think the first plank in that goal would be to, to, to deconstruct the whole notion of chronology and narrative. And so that's something that I very consciously do as I write. It makes the project very, very difficult. It makes it take a lot longer than it normally would. But I think the product will speak for itself once it's actually finished. Is it possible to make it tabloid proof as well? <laughs> because you know that you know whatever you're going to write that Rolling Stone or whatever are going to try and find something in it. Is it possible to find a way around that by using this narrative? Well, to- I'm glad that you brought that up because it actually reminds me of some of the m- the most recent sensationalistic and cr- uh, cynical takeaways that the music press has, you know, concocted. For me, in my own case, and and I think this is probably one of the reasons why, as you <laughs> so patiently saw, <laughs> that I have feel the need to kind of you know uh, preempt any interviews that I give with a certain set of guidelines because uh, you know I've seen what this sort of what the industrial entertainment industrial complex likes to do and how it completely you know robs an artist of, of their autonomy. And in this case, and here's an example. So, you know, five years ago I did an interview, you know, and this was, I I really just 
was just out of school. I hadn't spoken to a journalist in probably seven years. And I, uh, someone approached me and I figured, okay, I've just graduated. It's time for me to, to just talk about where I've been, which I did in the interview. Um, and of course, you know, I, I, it was naive of me because I should have understood that, you know, people have been wondering. And so media outlets are going to consider that to be a news item. You know, Carlos Dengler breaks his silence or Carlos D breaks his <laughs> silence and all these sorts of like handy dandy uh, slogans that the media like to use. What what ended up happening was that the most, the biggest takeaway that you would see, which is, and this is also something that I, I, you know, seven years is a long time to get out. And it was during those seven years that a lot changed in sort of the media ecosphere, the way social media sort of took off. It all happened while I was in school. So in a way I was kind of in a, I was kind of hibernating while social media was essentially taking over the media ecosphere. And so I didn't know that there were these things where, you know, one outlet would print something and then every other single outlet would run that story by just quoting that original outlet so that therefore, if you search for this, you see like 20 different uh, magazines all running the same story, all quoting the same thing, right? Because they all kind of, they go into the scrum like they're chasing a football and they they sort of grab it. Oh, that's 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 the thing. That's that's the narrative. He said that he said that now let's make that the story. Right. And what they said that he said in this case, I got to be careful about how excited I get to tell the story because I'm also looking at the waveforms in my logic session and, and, <laughs> and I just blew out the mic. I can see that in the waveforms anyway. Um <laughs> The, the takeaway was that apparently Carlos Dengler thinks that Coldplay is boring. And that's like the big story from that piece, right? Even though it was one line and it was completely taken out of context because that's not in fact what I said. What I did say was that I went to see Coldplay uh, on Saturday Night Live and... Um, it was kind of like a teaching moment for me because normally I I would be really inspired by a band, but instead I was inspired by the, the actors playing Saturday Night Live. This was right before I went into acting school. So what I was trying to communicate was that some other art form, not the one that you normally expect, was pulling me in that direction. And Coldplay just happened to be the band that was playing. It wasn't that I thought they were so boring that the skits actually ended up being more entertaining. That was the takeaway that they took. So you can see how that little twist, that little bit of manipulation, and the media just does this constantly. I mean, this is just how, this is how they make money. This is, this is sort of the business principle. It doesn't matter what you say or what you do, uh, or it doesn't matter what you say in the interview. It matters like what they can extract from it out of context and tweak it. It's not exactly, I'm not exactly like, you know, blowing any whistles here. We all know that this happens, but in, this was just sort of an example of how I, I have come the hard way to learn about these sorts of things. So you raise a very good point because as I write these essays, I, I do once in a while think to myself, oh, okay, this looks right here, this line that I just wrote looks like something that, you know, somewhere in Rolling Stone or in Pitchfork, they're going to hire somebody, you know, to comb through my personal essay collection and with specific instructions to find the most sensationalist, lascivious, out of context -y type of lines that that person can find so that they can run it as clickbait for their own publications. I'm sure that that's what's going to happen which means that they're not going to approach the work as a work or they're not going to approach the work as a work of mine. They're going to approach the work as some kind of experiment that this guy that they're obsessed with from the aughts is, is doing right now. And that's only of interest to them by virtue of that. Um, and when I realized that I asked myself, Oh, should I, uh, maybe I should erase this line. <laughs> but then I have to think twice. I'm like, okay, I'm not, I can't control that, right? Like I can do what I can to insulate this book from those kinds of craven, cynical attempts, but it's not going to be bulletproof. There's just no way, right? So I, I can't edit myself. I can't 
take out. You can't self censor. No, no, that that would be really really shameful. It's a slippery slope. It's a very once slippery. you start doing it on one little thing. Oh yeah. yeah, and it also will make it'll degrade the work, right? It's about the work. That's really. I mean, if there's any theme that you know my rant, my 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 twenty minute long rant just now <laughs> should <laughs> should should prove it's that it's about what I really wish to say is that it is about the work. You know, it is always about the work. And then the other thing is that what we've or what we've just been speaking about. That's also what's killing the media. That's why it's slowly dying out because people are sick of this kind of out of context, false approach to information and just everything. Well, that's why things like what you're doing are taking off, right? That's why people are people are thirsting. That's why Substack is taking off. That's why Medium is a thing. That's why all. That's why people like Glenn Greenwald are migrating over to these platforms for that exact reason. There's a revolution that's happening. And I'm very happy to to note that the revolution is happening in the direction of quality. Sometimes, you know, I th- I don't think that the demise of the local weekly or the local newspaper is a good thing. I think that's a bad thing for for discourse, for political discourse, for for information, for everything. And you know, I don't think that they're the ones. Local local out media outlets are not not to blame here. We're, I'm talking about national big media outlets. I I can't say that. There wouldn't be at least a smidgen of Schadenfreude to find out that, let's say, a Rolling Stone had to had to kind of you know pull its issues off the racks because it just couldn't it couldn't uh, it couldn't justify the expense anymore. You know, they're an interesting kind of juxtaposition of a magazine, though, because on the one hand, they feel like they're desperately clawing to remain relevant by you know whenever they put out a five hundred greatest albums of all time, they're going to throw the latest Harry Styles album on there. But at the same time, they're kind of falling into these old traps of sensationalizing everything that everyone says. And like the enemy, you know, running with a headline completely out of context. Yes. I mean, I'm, you know, the enemy, I think, <laughs> in a way, like now that the enemy, the enemy is still a website, right? It's not. Well, it's no longer print. Yeah. It's just a yeah, yeah. website. Yeah. But they, they essentially do what they didn't print on a website, right? I mean, they're, they're still doing interviews and they're still reporting, right? Yeah. And in the same fashion sure like the daily mail but, of yeah yes the daily mail of, of music journalism exactly and yet they're such a kingmaker aren't they like it's 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 like if you don't pass through their 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 fist you know if you if you don't allow the the enemy fist to squeeze every drop of blood from you then you can't it's like a hazing ritual you know and and in a way i I, 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 I long for the days of the enemy because because they were at least you knew that that's they didn't they didn't even try to hide it even back then they didn't try to hide it. <laughs> they uh, I remember reading last year they ran this cover story. I get they, that was another word then they still call it a cover story but there's no cover to the magazine but they call it a cover story and it was with a band called Porridge Radio really great record sophomore record they put out last year got nominated for the Mercury Prize and all that. And the headline they ran with was something like Porridge Radio aren't surprised that people are finally catching on. And we all, or it was like, we always thought we were the biggest band in the world. And in the article, they had said it as like a glib comment, like sarcastically. And then the enemy had taken it oh and ran with God. it as like this face value headline wow. of we're not surprised we're sh- or we should be the biggest band in the world or something. That that right there is is just, oh, I mean, that breaks my heart you know, just to hear that, that is, that is so, I mean, that's almost, that's like low hanging fruit, I would say. Like I, I, I would figure that yeah. a, a magazine like the enemy that, that that's been around as long as they have, that has been, you know, being the daily mail of music for, for as long as they have been, would try to, would try to finesse that a little bit more, but that just seems yeah. very glaringly obvious. Oh my God, the poor band. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, you know, we're kind of speaking a little bit there on the kind of rise in your media and different things coming up in the kind of fall of print journalism. What do you make of people like, you know, Sam Harris or Jordan Peterson or your Eric and your Brett Weinstein, these kind of slightly philosophical edged professors, figures that are kind of slightly edging into the mainstream now? Yeah, I mean, I think we're witnessing a kind of rise of, of the public intellectual, which I think is really great. I mean, the fact that somebody like Sam Harris could have the platform that he has and the, the, the reach 
that he has the mega, the, you know, the megaphone, the, 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 the size of that megaphone for someone who is essentially a, a he's a neuro, he's a neuroscientist by training, you know, um, that, that, that's incredible. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his podcast. I'm not exactly as politically aligned with his views as I'm much, much more left, uh, than he is, but I listen to him because he's just so captivating of a, of a presence and, and the way that he dis- dissects things, even if you don't agree with his conclusions, he's opened up the problem for you in such a logical way that it, it helps you come to your own decision about how you think about that issue. And sometimes I do agree with him. Um, Jordan Peterson, probably less so. I feel like he's a, but I'm, a, I'm glad that he's, you know, like he, he, like so many others are bringing intellectual fair to a much more mainstream audience. In Jordan Peterson's case, I feel like there's a lot of men's movement stuff in there that he doesn't disavow enough for my taste. But, you know, I mean, I think that was very 2018 of a thing. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not so sure where things are going to land. Like I know that Sam Harris was able to sort of escape the kind of, um, opprobrium of being lumped in with the dark intellectual web, the so-called dark intellectual web or intellectual. Such a funny term. Yeah. Yeah. Intellectual dark web. I think that's what it is. I can't remember. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. He, you know, he, he's eluded that the grasp of that. I don't think that's, I think that was like a fashionable term of art for like a year. So I don't know what Jordan Peterson's going to do in any case. He's, a, he's a good example. I think Sam Harris is the best example. I think it, it is, a, it, we live in such a, such a fallen, complicated world world now that we need these these voices we we if we're in our apartments especially now with quarantine if we're cleaning if we're just doing stuff around the home we got to have somebody like Sam Harris piping into our eardrums to help us negotiate the complexities of that which we face today um and it has to be on that much much more precise higher level it cannot be vulgar and meaningless like most mainstream fare is no for sure was there a version you know what you're saying that we have like sam harris piping into the the home at the moment was there a version of that in the 90s when you were studying philosophy was there a, an equivalent to that and no, a voice? no no i mean that that whole idea was <laughs> i mean i i just i, I would if you would have told me that in the 90s when I was studying philosophy that, you know, there'd be this website that you could go to where you could upload lectures on Hegel and Kant and Heidegger and Husserl, like other professors in other colleges that are being filmed, and you can just like watch them for free and then listen to, you know, I don't, I, I don't think anyone would have understood stood the term podcast, but if you had said, you know, radio, a, a kind of radio show that comes through the internet, where they're talking about, you know, philosophical concepts like and, and issues like atheism and theism, theism versus atheism and so on and so forth. Uh, that would have blown my mind. I mean, that would have just blown my mind. And here we are. I mean, it's fantastic. This is like, you know, sometimes I'll go down, you know, a Wittgenstein rabbit hole <laughs> on YouTube. I think it's awesome. <laughs> of course, there are problems with that. I mean, then there are people who are going down the right wing uh, rabbit hole and and that's that's a real huge problem. I, I imagine that YouTube is working on those sort of algorithmic issues. But you know, in terms of just taking taking like a quick dose of it's good because if you're like, I want to read a book on philosophy, like I've it's been a while since I've read a book on philosophy. Where should I go? You can just go to YouTube and spend like an hour or a couple hours listening to some lectures about this philosopher, about that philosopher, and then you can come to your decision and then you go get the book and then you dive in, which I think is just a really, really powerful means of transmission for stuff that would normally in the past have driven a lot of people away because they they just wouldn't have had the time or the inclination to really try to find the book that they're like truly in search of. Were there books that were particularly important to you growing up that kind of pushed you in this direction to, you know, study philosophy at that time or become intrigued by it? My journey to philosophy is kind of analogous to my journey to classical music. Just very briefly, a lot of times 
especially like indie kids, you know, there's a whole crossover genre of indie classical right now, which I think is fascinating. It's, it's a lot of just people in Brooklyn, but it's great. A friend of mine has a label called New Amsterdam that is just tons and tons of just some of the most interesting music that combines indie indie rock and classical music. And of course, Bryce Desner, you know, is, is one of the most, is perhaps the, the most famous example of this type of crossover uh, musician. And a lot of, I think a lot of us, maybe not just indie rock, but just rockers in general, kind of make their way to classical music through, through um, prog rock. So pr- prog rock is sort of the first stop in the music adventurer's journey, right? So you start off with pop music and let's say in my case, heavy metal. And then, you know, so then you listen to this one band that has six minute long songs and you're like, wow, that's crazy. And then you hear about, yes, a band who does one song per side of the album, right? And you're like, what? They jam for 20 minutes? Oh my <laughs> God. And so then you dive into that and and then after a while, you say, okay, so now I see where I'm headed. And then classical music becomes the next step. You sort of make the leap into that genre because it seems to offer the largest canvas upon which to, you know, exercise all of your musical gestures, you know, where rock can no longer capacitate it, let's say, without becoming unduly pretentious. I think it was similar for me with philosophy, but by way of kind of these Carlos Castaneda books where, you know, I did a lot of, uh, I didn't ever did LSD, but I smoked a lot of pot and I sat in my room listening to Pink Floyd and really just hallucinating, you know, the music, not, not colors or not, not an synesthetic experience, but just sort of listening to the same song that you listen to when you're sober, but when you're high is just like, wow, you know, obviously we've all done that to, to many a Pink Floyd song. And, you know, a lot of these songs were designed for that. And then of course, it's just one more step to, oh, Carlos Castaneda was this author who met this, you know, Mexican um, guru and did a whole bunch of peyote with, with that guy. And he saw eagles and saw crows flying and went down into the desert and blah, 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 blah. And of course, this seems like, oh, I want to read about that. And then you read about all the acid trips that he did. Of course, then you're into Timothy Leary by this point. You're you're reading the, the motorcycle acid test or whatever the hell it's called. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. Um, what's it called? I can't think of it. In any case, and, you know, and, and Kurt Vonnegut and, and all of those all of those guys. Um, and so then you're just like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not satisfied with this. I want to take the next leap. And then you, by chance, you know, discover Descartes. For me, it was a girl that I was dating who was taking a philosophy class. And she knew how much I was interested in all of this sort of pseudo spiritual kind of uh, Timothy Leary type of counterculturalist fair and uh, asked me to try to decipher what what Descartes was saying in this one passage. And without having ever read Descartes, I, I, I was able to kind of give her a little bit of, a, of an assist and then notice, whoa, I really like this. I really, this really speaks to me. I want to read more about this. And then that's what got me into philosophy. And then I realized, oh, okay, so this is, this is where you really tackle these issues. Like this is sort of the intellectual this is where the real work gets done. From that point forward, one thing led to another. I mean, you, I read one, one book by Nietzsche and, and that just kind of set me off. Yeah. You just get, you get into the flow of it and before you, or momentum is probably a better momentum. way to describe it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Was that the same for you when you started studying acting? Cause you, you weren't massively into theater before you began studying acting, right? It was kind of what, yeah, you, you know what's interesting is like I hated all the kids that would star in the school plays in high school. And these were a lot of the kids that I ended up being in school with. I hated musicals. I mean, I, I still kind of hate musicals. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> I feel like I'm betraying the cause because so many of my my colleagues are huge musical fans. But um, let let me put it this way. My appreciation for the genre has been expanded as a result of my time in acting school. But, you know, there's a limit to that expansion. (laughs) And historically, I certainly was not uh, 
a, a fan of the genre, especially if you're a goth, it's really hard to be into musicals. You know, it's, <laughs> if there's if there's a genre that's antithetical to to goth music, it's it's uh, it's the musical. Um, I'm trying to think of a goth musical. Oof, I think that would be really bad. <laughs> <laughs> it would be really it would be really boring, is what it would be. <laughs> um, yeah. So because to me, the kids who participated in in the school plays were you know they were nice kids they didn't want to piss teachers off that was sort of my mo like i just wanted to completely piss everybody off that was that was the the plan is like i did not want to participate i did not want to cooperate at all participating in an extracurricular activity was a form of cooperation and you know high school plays were an extracurricular activity so i just always frowned upon upon that but then you know when it I experienced success with Interpol, I realized that I was a performer, you know, I didn't know that, that, and and I, and I have to say that perhaps this is a case where the media in a, in a way kind of, maybe, I don't want to say that it taught me something, but it showed me that if I wished to translate what I was feeling inside in a way that was kind of uh, communicable through the means that the media uses, such as photographs and videos and statements to the press that, you know, there was a persona that I could craft there. You know, I, I could do it because I was sort of doing it unconsciously. I never like went out of my way to think about doing the things that I did when I was in the band, but I just did them because they felt natural. And then lo and behold, they seemed to attract attention. Right. It seemed to be a thing where this persona of this sort of vampiric da- bass player from the band Interpol kind of took hold. And so I noticed that and I said, oh, well, they really like this character that I'm building that I didn't even know that I was building, but that I am, I guess. And I said to myself, man, it would be a lot of fun to, to do this with other types of actors. You know, and then my knowledge of Shakespeare and all the other and, and my love of cinema started to kind of get involved in that that art that creative process and i said oh there's all these characters in these movies that i adore like if it works for the character that i'm building right now then i might be able to do that with these types of characters i might have a knack to 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 play a certain type of person so on and so forth i was thinking about character actors mostly so i started taking some acting classes and i just thought oh okay let me like you know, take some acting classes and then I'll talk to our manager and see if there's, if, if I could be introduced to an agent and maybe I'll play like some, some like small bit character roles in, in some, some movie or something. Maybe there's a director out there of, of some like indie movie who wants to, who wants to like feature me in it because they're a fan of the band. I don't know. You know, I mean, this story is not, you know, so outlandish, it happens all the time, right? I mean, they're- Like RZA kind of often pops up in little bit part roles and stuff. It was in the last Jim Jarmusch movie. There you go. And also um, Mos Def, although that's not what he's known by right now. And he's he's a fantastic actor, actually. And the the gentleman, I've, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name from TV on the radio, is also an actor. Will Oldham is an actor. You know, so th- none of this is like, I'm not, I wasn't inventing anything by, by thinking of these things. But what ended up happening was that I fell in love with, with plays. I just started like, you know, we tackled some plays like a Sam Shepard play in scene study class. And I just, from there, it was similar to the discovery of philosophy where you read the one book and then the momentum builds from that. You can't, you just, the thirst happens. And I think when you're in, uh, the music industry, especially especially the, the size of, of the exposure that Interpol was getting, um, which they still get, but also obviously when, when I was in the band. And I think I would definitely ascribe my, my, my disgust with capitalism to sort of being in the belly of the beast, if you will. There's, there's just the way that things work on that level is so devoid of culture so devoid of ideas, so devoid of substance. It's such an empty, empty uh, world that when I discovered these plays, there, it was like there was a um, there was something empty within me that was now getting filled. It was almost like there was a container within me 
like an urn that had been empty for so long, for like years while, you know, we were touring, that was just yearning for something to be filled with it. And when I when I was in that class and, and we tackled some Sam Shepard, it was like someone just dumped a little bit of liquid into that urn within. And I felt it. I said, oh my God, I need more of that. You know, then of course, once you, you taste the first bite, you can't have, you can't stop, right? So then Sam Shepard led to Angels of an America. Then it led to shake back to Shakespeare. Then it led to all the classics. Then I discovered Ibsen. Then I discovered... Strindberg. Then I discovered all the the playwrights who were contemporaries who were putting out plays like Lobby Hero, and I would then go to Broadway to see the latest plays. And then I started reading the theater reviews in the New York Times, and I said, "Oh my God, that sounds amazing!" So I would go to that play, and then I would meet this director, and then I went to this acting school, and so on and so forth. And then next thing you know, it's 2015. <laughs> I don't have a career anymore, <laughs> but I have an MFA in acting. <laughs> It's almost, can you, you know, that, that first kind of taste of it you were speaking about there, can you ever get back to that? Is it like chasing your first high or can you actually kind of replicate that feeling and achieve it again to the same degree? Well, I, I, I'm getting that spark now, you know, with the music that I'm writing now because it's been so long since I've written. So there's this feeling of like, ooh, this feeling again, which it's, it's been a while. Um, I get that feeling as I write my essays because that's a relatively new form. Um, I think there is a way, I think, I think with acting and look, this is why you don't make money as a theater actor. My, my, my theater, my colleagues in the theater tend to say, you know, I don't, I don't have a theater career. I have a theater habit. (laughs) And it's true. It is a habit. It actually costs you money to be a theater actor. You have to supplement your habit with TV. That's sort of, there's, that's the business model, right? And there's just something so satisfying about that world that if you could break in and if you can get work, you're just dealing with a, an art form that is just much more rewarding, just just by its very nature. It's more organic. It's quieter. The passages are longer. You know, the writing is deeper. It's just, it asks for a different response from the audience that's a lot more generous. And so you can, you can actually fill the vessel regularly with that, with that work. Uh, you just have to be willing to make sacrifices when it comes to money, when it comes to, I don't want to say quality of life because that makes it sound like you have to suffer and I'm not, I'm certainly not suffering, but, um, you know, you, you do have to, you have, you have to accept that you're, you're going to have to live m- more modestly, let's put it that way. Um, but the rewards are, 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 make it well worth it. We are almost entering a dangerous position though, where that is what all art becomes. Like we seem to be heading in this way where as it gets a lot less viable to enter a lot of different worlds and a lot of it, it kind of becomes sealed off to a lot of people, if that makes sense. Unpack unpack that a little bit. I, I want to make sure that I'm following you. I know a lot of new bands and stuff coming through and the kind of window of income for them is getting kind of narrowed down further and further. And it feels like the film industry also to a certain degree. But then, oh, I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. I'm thinking of this more in terms of a Britain issue because of the way that we seem to be getting a little bit more isolated and mm-hmm. the kind of doors seem to be closing a little bit. If that makes sense. You're speaking of Brexit. Yeah. Yeah. Trying not to say the B word. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. You guys started it. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. Um, It was after Bowie died. Everything started falling apart. There was an, I don't know if you caught that, but there was a New York times essay that, that was specifically about that. In fact, it said, was there actually? Yeah. Yeah. It said like after Bowie, Bowie died and then the world fell apart. And it is very true. He died in January, 2016 and you know, Brexit happened in June. So, right. It was June. Um, yeah. And then Trump and then Trump. So, I mean, it's absolutely true. He was sort of like the, the angelic alien that was holding everything together. Right. (laughs) And it's, you know, what's interesting is that I used to think, man, it's going to be weird when Bowie dies. Like, how are we going to live in that world? Right. And, and well, here's the answer. You don't, (laughs) but um, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely true. I mean, I, uh, woe be the, the, the budding, the burgeoning musician of 2021, because uh, it's certainly not an industry that I would try to break into today. And I'm not saying that just because I've already broken quote unquote, broken into it. The landscape is, is utterly different than, than, I mean, just, just, 
just the whole no, the whole phenomenon of a 360 deal. I don't know if you're familiar with this idea. I'm um, not. The 360 deal is sort of what it was the music industry's answer to the MP3. Because once the MP once the downloadable free MP3 or free streaming on YouTube phenomenon began um, and, you know, industry, the music industry lost control over that critical part of its business model. It could no longer offer bands the sweet deals that the sweet contracts, the plush sort of cushy, palmy contracts that it once did, which we were the beneficiaries of um, Interpol uh, at a certain time. And in fact, Capitol Records if I recall correctly, this is a while ago, reneged on their deal as a direct result of this sort of revolution because they saw their the contract that we were one of the last. They saw the contract that had been signed and the MP3 revolution happened in about 2004, 2005, I believe. And, and they said, what? No way. This isn't happening. So they just found a way to kind of drop us because they were going to lose millions um, if if they were to to continue with us, so what the music industry did as a, as in response was concoct this thing called the three hundred and sixty deal because before the they didn't have to touch merchandise or touring. Essentially, the band pocketed the everything from the tours, and uh, the music company the the uh, record label made money off of the of off of record sales. Well, now you can't make money off of record sales. So what is a what is a music la- what is a record label to do? Uh, well, they're going to say, well, we'll we'll put out your music, but we're you're going to have to give us a cut from your touring, which means that the band is going to have to tour <laughs> constantly. So, I mean, this is one of the biggest reasons why I decided to leave the music industry, because not only did I hate touring to begin with, I certainly was in no position to augment the level of touring or to continue down a career that would actually rely on touring. And I just think this so this 360 deal to me is just it, it's it's just draconian. It's absolutely draconian. And I would say that it's draconian for any band today to try to to make it somewhere. So of course you have these niche genres that are music is very rococo today. This everything's sort of derived from other recycled bits. There's like this endless procession of retrospection and recycling and it's exciting on many many levels and the splintering that's happening is really really exciting you have like 500 micro genres right and any band can be really successful within them but as you say the opportunities to actually make a living off of this uh are are almost you know non-existent yeah i think it's going to be the same problem that a lot of industries face in years to come as well with the way that the internet has made a lot of things free and also we're going to see ai starting to come in Mm. probably within the next 20 years in a significant way oh yeah well that is actually i don't know if you've read yuval noah harari the sapiens book yes so he has really you know when he in homo deus which is his follow-up to uh sapiens uh he he has some really interesting thoughts about you don't need to necessarily read the book. You can sort of watch any of his talks on YouTube where he kind of, it's one of his big themes about how the algorithm knows you better than you know yourself. Mm, yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, if in the next 20 years, we're going to see what AI does to our, even our own music listening habits, you know, who knows there might be AI in this logic session that I'm, that I'm playing right now. Like the logic bot, AI bot might tell me, oh, do you really want to play that C sharp there? Don't you want to play this? And then I might say, oh my God, that's true. I, that's what I really wanted to say. Thank you, Logic. Thank you. All hail the AI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how if dystopian. You can't be enjoying it. How dystopian. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, speaking of dystopian, what was the piece you wrote on gentrification as well? a little while back. I'm glad you brought that up because I that's actually an essay that I want I really want to rewrite for the book and to heavily I want to heavily revise that that piece actually. Why why do you bring it up? Let me ask you. I think dystopian's in the title of it. Is oh, gentrification yes. is it eternal paradise oh, yeah. or dystopian or something is Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an interesting one though. The way you kind of weave your personal edge into it and kind of look at our role like we all think gentrification is a bad thing but then we're sitting there sipping our starbucks coffee or whatever that was the goal to kind of put the mirror on us a bit you know all of us who are who you know it's very fashionable to kind of complain about gentrification 
Now, the problem that I have with the essay is that it was a little bit a creature of someone who was still learning some of the stuff that that I have since learned. And, you know, there are some real points in the essay where I feel like I'm coming from a, uh, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't interrogate my own perspective adequately. And I think as a result, it, it, it can kind of come across as elitist or um, privileged. I think that gentrification is a huge problem by dint of how it, how it turns the screw on people who don't really have the means that perhaps someone like myself has. So the idea that, you know, I could just come into a neighborhood and buy my way into it and fuck the people who were living there before they no longer get to live there anymore because prices have gone up. I mean, that is a pernicious idea and that's gentrification. And I think that, you know, we think about gentrification as kind of like this, Oh, there's there's another Starbucks, but it's a it's a lot more pernicious than that. For in my own my own neighborhood's a case in point. I live very close to a, a large bus terminal, and underneath the bus terminal terminal, it was under construction for a very very long time. And then word got out that a supermarket was being planned, and there were a lot of people who said, "Oh, I hope it's a it's a a, um, a Whole Foods." And um, there were a lot of complaints about that idea. And I have to admit that my first inkling was to think, oh my God, how great would it be to have a Whole Foods in my neighborhood? (laughs) Well, thankfully it's not a Whole Foods. It's a much more modest, straightforward supermarket that got built in there. And you know what? Thank God, because I know that many of the people that live here wouldn't be able to afford to go to that Whole Foods. So where would they get their food? They need food too. You know, I don't, I don't need those things. I can learn to live without Whole Foods. And it teaches me something. So I want to rewrite that essay and make sure that I'm, you know, there's a lot in there that I want to keep, but I want to make sure that I, I am not um, cavalier or vague or overly ambivalent about those, those points that I just made. So is the, collect- wait, so are you going to write it as an essay for the book or one? Yes. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, because the book is a collection of personal essays. So, for instance, the one that's that was published on N Plus One that was sort of timed to the 15th anniversary of Turn On The Bright Lights. The Stories of Excess. Stories of Excess. That's going to be, you know, revised and probably lengthened for the book. So, yeah, because I, 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 have, I have a bunch of material out there that's in varying forms of quality. And I wish to, like, you know, bring them all up to the same level and publish it as a book. So this is going to be not only telling your kind of personal life in a direct sense, but also looking at kind of broader issues like like we're seeing their gentrification and how it kind of relates to us as individuals. Exactly. Exactly. That's just, just, that's just one example. Yes. Yeah. So do you have an, do you already have it quite mapped out in terms of the kind of topics that you're wanting to touch upon in it? Yeah. uh, There's still some that I'm, I'm uh, working on uh, in terms of just getting clear about what the theme is. But for instance, right now I'm finishing up an essay that's about a friendship that I had with someone right before I moved to New York. Um, And it's really about our own personal ambitions, but how like self-deluded we were. So the theme that I'm interested in exploring in this piece is the extent to which ambition relies on self-delusion, which I think is you know, relevant to anybody who's looking to try to succeed in any, anything that might seem kind of unlikely, such as a career in music or in the arts, you know, to what extent do I need to fake so-called fake it till you make it syndrome in order to be successful? And what does that mean? Like, why does, why do we have to be so self-deluded in order to reach our goals? Like, when do I get to actually be in reality? Um, so the story that I have with this friend of mine is like emblematic of that idea. So I'm, tr- I'm trying to tell the story through that prism. That's an example. So, you know, there are other, you know, I'll be going back into my days in the music industry and sort of critiquing a lot of the stuff that I encountered. My drug usage, for instance, will get a kind of critical theorist take, you could say. <laughs> That's like, well, again, I, that's promise, to- I promise it'll be entertainment, entertaining on some level. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, that is something you touch upon in Stories of Excess, though. You kind of look at the idea of druggies being related to this concept of 
rock and roll yeah or rock music that's ex- that was my attempt certainly in that essay yeah and i think if when i rewrite it for the book i'm going to try to be a little bit more expository about that particular point in terms of your own personal experience with it and also the actual point itself which i think you know uh, i wrote that essay and i was just kind of discovering this sort of mode of speaking right and uh i feel like you know that was what three years ago or something like that so you know you know, uh, a lot has happened in there. I've been writing nonstop since then. So um, whatever I would kind of put forward now would be dealing with it on the level that I wish to be dealt with at the moment. Yeah. Do you kind of reflect and analyze your past a lot at the moment if you're writing a lot of kind of personal essays? Yeah, you know, I, be, I just told my girlfriend uh, the, <laughs> the other day, uh, I'm basically living in the years 1987, 1996, and 2003. <laughs> like those are the years I'm living in right now. <laughs> Not a bad place to be living compared to where we're at, at the moment. I guess you could say that. Yeah. In, in many ways, it's rather fortuitous that this has happened because, you know, right now the present is almost unwatchable. So uh, it's good to have a place to kind of uh, a Narnia within which to subsist uh, and write about, and which is exactly what I'm doing. It, it, it's it's really kind of like an out-of-body experience, so it's it's very surreal. Um, and I, and I, I'll be frank, I, I can't wait for this book to be over so that I can just get in my uh, time machine and, and enter the present day. Um, <laughs> but, I, you know, I'm doing my research. I'm reading my journals. I'm going back to old press clippings. And, uh, and it's exciting. And I'm really looking forward to putting out something that I hope... W- you know, will appeal not just to music fans, obviously, but but to uh, to people who are interested in culture and in um, in ideas and in read and in writing. Yeah, similar to the Homo Sapiens interrupt us. Exactly, exactly. Just to touch upon what you were saying about there about you know looking and delving back into your past, being an out of body experience in some respects. Can theater ever kind of serve that purpose for you as well? Yeah, I mean, that's the really addictive part about acting is these, uh, I, th- I fell in love with acting because for the same reason why I just loved, you know, sort of being a star when I was in the music industry. I'm somewhat paying the price for that, that love affair because as, as I'm sure you know from having read the uh, tip sheet that I sent you, you know, I, 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 my present day endeavor is to try to, to separate myself as much as possible from the, that persona um, and to try to point towards the, the person who created the persona, not the persona itself. And I think that that's a lot trickier than, you know, it may sound just off at first blush. But I loved, I loved playing that persona and... I love playing personae. So acting is a way to, you know, it's just, it's, if there is an art form that really, really, truly traffics in magic, it is acting. It it is truly startling. I mean, regularly to have seen my classmates transform right before my eyes, you know, it's just, it's quite an experience to, to, to witness the ability to turn your body into such a flexible instrument and to inhabit whole worlds and other thoughts. I think it's, it's necessary for, for a healthy society. I think it dates back to a very early time in, in civilization for good reason. It's a religious experience. It's a sacred experience and it it can be an addictive experience for the performer as well. Yeah. What you're saying there as well, but you know, you'll watch your classmates turn into someone completely different in front of you. There's this thing about acting that when you put it in that more controlled environment it's a lot more striking than just having a persona because a persona kind of appears to be all the time whereas acting like you say you're seeing the transformation occurring almost instantaneously i'm glad you brought that up yes you're right and and uh, i think that was the reason why i another another reason perhaps more practical one of why i wanted to pursue acting this distaste that I started to have with the way that the persona of the musicians in the rock music industry, I'll just be more specific about the, the music genre in rock music, but it also happens very much to a large degree in hip hop, that there's just this unwillingness to kind of allow the musician to occupy different persona. Like you, you pick the one and then that's who you are. And you're not allowed to step out of that costume. 
and to me, acting seemed like a, a career or a, or an art form where the expectation was it was very well known that the person who is being, you know, Jack Sparrow, the guy playing Jack Sparrow is actually not Jack Sparrow. He's um, Johnny Depp, right? And so we know who Johnny Depp is, not because we know Johnny Depp. And if if the previous couple of years is anything to go by, I don't know that we're all that interested in knowing Johnny Depp. <laughs> but <laughs> that being, you know, scandals aside, we don't know Johnny Depp. And even we, we still don't. Know. I mean, he could walk into my house right now and I could probably have a really good time. I mean, maybe he's like a very cool guy. I don't know. I don't want to say that I know anything about Johnny Depp, the person. But Johnny Depp, the artist, we do know. And it has he Johnny Depp, the artist, has nothing to do with Jack Sparrow or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or anything like that. We know that there's a guy there, right? An artist, putatively at least. And that's baked into the career, into the, into the art form, in a way that I don't think is the case in music. Uh, and I, I got very attracted to that. Yeah, it's almost like the same freedom, but with less of the drawbacks. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, that's, that's, I, I would to- totally sign off on that interpretation. <laughs> I was reading your essay on Henry Rollins as well. Is he someone you would kind of, you know, slide into that category of having occupied a persona and is kind of playing a part to a certain extent? Yeah. Henry Rollins, I think, is a really interesting example of somebody who has managed to cultivate a persona that really does feel truly authentic. Like, it does feel like that's who he is. And I bet it is who he is. You know, I, 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 I would bet that he gets out of bed, he wakes up and he is instantly himself without needing to filter that through anything that maybe somebody else might need to filter it through. Um, and the kind of career that he's been able to enjoy, I think, is just absolutely spectacular. I, I just can't think of somebody who has had the level of freedom and independence to kind of just dabble with what he wants to dabble in. And it's interesting too, because he's also very much wedded to zeitgeists. So in the eighties, he was terribly uncool. Like he was just known as this like real guy with super duper anger management issues. You did not want to talk to him and you didn't want to get close to him. And he was just that guy in that band that we all love. And then in the nineties, he became very cool. Like that's when Rollins band like really took off. Then in the aughts, he became uncool again. Like you were just like Henry Rollins. Ugh. And then in the teens, <laughs> he suddenly became this like renaissance, this aged like warrior that was like this renaissance man. Right. And, you know, that just speaks to how authentic he is. He's not like running with the wind. Right. He's just being himself. And when he's cool, he's cool. And when he's uncool, he's uncool. And he doesn't give a, a shit. I don't know if I can say that on here. I think you I can, can say that. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I think with the essay, I think what's interesting about that particular TV episode, which is now very dated. I mean, it's very, from a long, long, long time ago. Um, but 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 it was late enough in his career where he you could consider, you know, his heyday behind him. Let's say, for lack of a better better word, but it's just it's interesting to see him. You know, I think one of the pitfalls of being famous for being yourself is that then you don't get to escape yourself limitations and all, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Like you don't, it's not like he's causing harm to the world, but you can really see how he was completely unwilling during this episode to kind of, to, to, to try to show a better side of himself. And again, I don't want to be like, doctrinaire and say, oh, you should be doing that. Like that there's some moral of the story here. He didn't do anything wrong. In fact, it should be lauded that he was as honest as he was. But I just think it's interesting to be somebody like him who is so comfortable, for instance, not even being therapized. And again, I don't know, maybe he does see a therapist, but he doesn't show some of the things that you often see in people who have undergone therapy, who have interrogated their, their motives to a certain extent. Um, and yet he somehow gets by and somehow stays relevant and stays cool. And I just think that this is a wonderful achievement and, and almost impossible to replicate. 